Bonjour, mes amis. It is rainy, it is wet, it is cold and damp and moist, and it's the sometimes vlog. Yeah, yeah. It's a vlog that happens sometimes. Welcome back to the Louvre here in Paris, France. That's right, I'm on another continent. How are you doing? I'd love to talk to you more out here, but there's something that we've got to see inside of the museum as quickly as possible. Cause it's really damp, it's like misty. It's not really raining, but it's misty enough that your shoes get wet and your hood gets wet. It's all soggy and gross. So I don't want to stand out here anymore. Without further ado, let's get inside the Louvre. There we go, that is much better. Basically there is a huge long security line up there and the metal detectors are right up on top of that platform. And you can finally get down inside the Louvre itself. We better be moving on because we've got a meeting. I have a ticket check right over here, but yeah, I've been in France for two days and yesterday was my first full day in France. And the first opportunity that I had to film, I went out and filmed Random Land all day. And it's a good thing that I did. I mean, I hit the ground hard. I walked like 20 miles and that's with taking Ubers. I walked 20 miles and filmed all kinds of stuff and went to all kinds of sights and experienced the sounds and smells of Paris. Um, but even doing all that, it was a good thing I did it yesterday because it wasn't, it wasn't sunny, but it was just cloudy. Today, there's no rain on the forecast. There's no rain on the weather app. But when you get outside, it is wet. It is pouring down water everywhere. It's like that weird misty drizzle, like when you're in a cloud and uh, yeah, it's moist. So everybody outside was sort of moist and miserable. And what's worse than it just being sort of drizzly moist is it's not coming straight down. It's coming like at that weird angle where it's coming right in your face and everyone's just wet. So I went out, got my shoes and socks all wet, went back to the hotel, switched shoes to the old classics with a rubber toe to keep the rain off of the tip of my sock, but it's too late for my left foot. It's a little soggy, but that is fine. So today is the perfect day for the sometimes vlog. And I didn't know if I'd have one day in Paris or two days in Paris, which is why I filmed like everything that I could yesterday. So it seems like this is a very impromptu trip, a very impromptu vlog. Normally I like to keep the sometimes vlog as unstudied and unedited as possible. Just sort of walk and talk, do some random stuff, see some random things. But today's a little different. I'll be cutting slightly when we go through like security things or anything like that. And hopefully after we have our meeting with our friend here in the Louvre, uh, it won't be so moist and soggy outside and we'll be able to walk along the River Seine, and maybe walk around a little bit in Paris. We'll see. I mean, we'll probably try to do that anyways, but it may get very moist on the screen. So you'll have that water drop effect the whole time. So we'll see how it goes. Now the Louvre is absolutely cavernous. By the way, you're gonna see this a lot in Europe. Flickering lights has to do with different frequencies and frame rates and all kinds of weird stuff. Anyway, this place is absolutely cavernous, massive. After all, it was once a palace for French kings before being turned into the largest art museum ever. It has literally miles and miles of passageways and all kinds of statues of Roman emperors. Let's see, where's this from? Yep, of course, Rome. I believe that says second century, but it's hard to tell. I get confused with my French words for things like century, you know. Look at all of that stuff, wow. Anyway, my point was it's absolutely cavernous, but I'm hopefully I remember how to get to where I'm trying to get to. It's kind of weird because no matter which way you enter the Louvre, you're going to walk through galleries you don't expect. I mean, no matter which path you choose, like I said, there's miles of passageways. This brings me back big time to the first time I ever came here and I was filming the uh, the five weird things in the Louvre. I think I may have already taken a wrong turn or a turn I didn't mean to. Oh my gosh, let's look at this. Oh my gosh. Can you guys see the pyramid out there? It's kind of weird because the Louvre is one of the biggest, most prestigious museums on the planet. And of course, they allow you to film here. You can film walking around. I have live streamed in here back in the day when I used to do Periscope. I mean, before live streaming was live streaming kind of a thing. I'm trying to see if this will adjust. Yes, look at that. I don't think so. Look at the pyramid 
outside. How about that? This guy's taking a fun pic, taking a fun selfie with the pyramid. Everyone's trying to stay out of the rain. That's what's going on here. Anyway, they let you film in the Louvre, which is crazy, but you never know in France. Most of the time, it's completely fine to film anywhere, but every once in a while, someone will go, hey, I'd really not like to be on camera. That's the only time it really becomes a problem. If somebody poses an objection, which is really the same at home. But the crazy thing is, I've been kicked out of art museums, like famously Tyler Evans and I, my old buddy Tyler, classic flavor, original flavor Tyler and I were kicked out of LACMA in LA, maybe the most today Instagram friendly, live streaming friendly place back in the day for having a video camera and filming in a museum. Now, I've watched enough Netflix documentaries and stuff now to know that art heists are a real thing that that happens actually, it's like a common thing, and that almost every art heist has, well, modern art heist has happened because someone's gone in and figured out exactly where the cameras are or when there's no guards in the room and that kind of thing, and they'll cut the painting off the wall and roll it up or something like that. Usually, I mean, I would have to assume usually or sometimes they're inside jobs. See, look, this is awesome. I actually remember where I'm going. Anyway, so I get it. I was in there with a video camera. We're filming, but that's actually just the excuse of why they kicked us out. The real reason they kicked us out of LACMA was because we were standing in a room and it's really quiet in there and there's a security guard in every room. Oh, I'm out of breath from these steps already. And Tyler, very quietly, but loud enough for that lady to hear, leans over and says, there's no rule that says you can't eat spaghetti in here, but like, you know it's frowned upon. <laughs> like that's almost verbatim what he said. And so I think I cut the camera, but we were dying laughing from that. And the lady that was in the room, the security guard, she was not pleased. And so from that point onward, she followed us around the whole museum. So she knew we weren't like filming security systems. She knew we weren't doing anything weird. She just knew we were having a laugh and uh, kind of being silly in there. And she did not appreciate it. So it's funny that in LA, in California, I can't film in an art museum. And there are many other museums in the United States that don't allow you to film. Whew, catching my breath, sorry. Because they think if you film in there, well, this is the excuse a lot of times, they think if you film in there that no one's gonna come see. Look at that. Nike, winged victory of Samothras, I believe. Winged victory of Samothras. There's a very famous statue there. And of course, you remember Audrey Hepburn. In funny face, she comes running down those stairs with a long train on her dress. Very slippery stairs, by the way. I have seen people eat it on those very stairs down there, but that's not what we're here for. We're not here for winged victory. We have another lady that I'm trying to reconnect with here. Allie, of course, is at home. She just started school again. Ooh, look at these beautiful paintings. Wow. Um, look at the ceilings. That's the thing I always forget to show, and a lot of people don't show when they come through the Louvre. Never see all of this stuff. In fact, I can't remember the statistics anymore. They were in the video I did um, in the Louvre. I did, I think I filmed a few times in the Louvre, and I brought up the statistics before, and they were closer at hand, but I forget what it is, but it's something like 90% of the visitors, or some crazy number like that. Uh, I could be exaggerating slightly, but a huge chunk of the millions and millions of visitors come into the Louvre, go straight, you know, spend five minutes or so trying to find Mona Lisa, go straight to Mona Lisa. Look at that. They look at her for something like, you know, 30 seconds or a minute. They take their pictures. Jeez Louise, look at that. Incredible. And then they bail. They get the heck out of here. Um, they might, you know, cruise down and go see Venus de Milo or some other famous uh, paintings in here. They might have one or two other things that they particularly are interested in, but then they'll bail because there's so many beautiful paintings here. It's very overwhelming. I've spent um, a couple different days that I've come here and spent hours just walking around looking. When I filmed that Five Weird Things video, I was here for hours and hours, like all day long. and. Um, been a couple of times I visited, very rarely, but a couple of times I got to visit. Look at that Grand Gallery here. Look at the size of this gallery. A couple of times that I visited here um, without a camera. 
but only a few. Anyway, it annoys me every time I go to a museum in the United States and they think, nobody's going to come here if we let you film it or there's a security thing or whatever. Like, and here you have the most famous, prestigious, greatest art museum on the planet, maybe. Let you film, walk around. I mean, I'm walking through this thing with a camera. Nobody's bothering me. Super duper strange. Each one of these paintings on the walls, well, maybe I shouldn't say each one because they got zillions of them, but most of the paintings on the walls, and especially in this grand gallery here, leading towards the most famous painting maybe in the entire world, are very famous paintings in their own right. So, here you go, the crucifixion. Uh, trying to see the artists here. With all these very if, uh, famous Italian painters, French painters, all this crazy European art is here. And during like the pandemic and during some of Ali's surgeries, I was watching a lot of weird art documentaries and uh, several times paintings in the Louvre that I had seen before walking through or when I was here to see Mona Lisa or here to film Five Weird Things or something, I would see these paintings and there'd be these whole long rich backstories, like a painting like this. And they'd go into detail about the artist and the style or how the style was changing and the symbolism over here. Like, look at this guy, he's getting slapped in the face. You see that? He's getting a face slap by a two-headed friend. And it's been a long time, I mean, elementary school since I really thought about the Greek mythology or Roman mythology. And so there's a lot of that kind of symbolism in paintings. And then there's obviously a lot of religious symbolism, but not just straight up like biblical symbolism, but lots of symbolism involving saints. And then lots of different painting eras have symbolism, you know, of the, of the individual school or of the time period. They'll, you know, like somebody might be wearing a red coat here or a red uh, robe and a blue thing. And that could symbolize something often actually you see like Mary in the red coat with the blue shirt. So I don't know if that's Mary right over here. Let's see. St. Stephen preaching in Jerusalem. So it could be, wasn't St. Stephen the first martyr? Didn't he get stoned to death? Not, <laughs> not didn't he get stoned? Didn't he get stoned to death? Or am I misremembering that? Anyway, the point is there's so much uh, art here that each individual piece has a whole backstory and that you could study and get into and you know I, I think I'm a relatively artsy person as far as the average Californian goes for sure like I'm interested and I go to museums and I mean the, most of the people I know I'd say eight out of ten would never go to a museum so like every ten years they might go to a, an art museum of any kind I've been to a lot of art museums I've seen a lot of art but I pretty much know nothing that's how it feels you know it's like, um, it's one of those things, it's such a deep subject. Whenever I see somebody young, like um, in their 20s, 30s, even in their 40s, so relatively young, like when if someone's got an old white beard, you think, of course they know everything. But when I see somebody relatively young, like me or down, who just knows everything about art and they can tell you about Caravaggio or Delacroix, or all these artists and tell you their history and all this deep stuff, I'm like blown away. Try to think of the name of one of the BBC shows, a Faker Fortune. There's a BBC show called Faker Fortune and I found a bunch of episodes on YouTube one day and I just sort of got hooked on that. I think it was like during Ali's last surgery or something. I forget exactly when I was watching that, but I kept, I got obsessed. I watched every episode I could of that show. And uh, Philip Mould and the other lady, they just go into great detail about different paintings. They're trying to authenticate paintings. So they would go and find, say like uh, whoever painted this, if there was a, a questionable painting that may be attributed to this particular painter. They would go and study the existing paintings. They'd x-ray them and scan them and do all this kind of crazy stuff. I actually recently watched a documentary about the Mona Lisa. I didn't know there are two other Mona Lisas in the world um, that some people thought were maybe the original Mona Lisa and not this one in France. I watched this whole long documentary. Can't remember, is it HBO Max or some, something like that? watched this whole long documentary about the Mona Lisa and how Leonardo may have painted two different ones and how um, I think Raphael sketched the Mona Lisa as Leonardo was working on it and her hair was different and the background was different. Uh, you could see these two columns on the side of her more easily and all this different kind of stuff. It was this whole long detailed thing. If I think of it and I can find it, I'll put the link or I'll say the name of the documentary in the description. But 
anyways, I watched this whole long documentary, like, wow, the Mona Lisa might not be the Mona Lisa, there might be this other Mona Lisa that's the real Mona Lisa, and this was a copy or, or um, a second attempt or a second version or something like that. And basically, the TLDR, spoiler alert, is you get to the end of the documentary and they're pretty much like, nah, this is pretty much the Mona Lisa. So basically, here's what we know. This is the Mona Lisa in here, and there she is, everybody. Look at this. Now, as you know, I have been to see Mona Lisa many, many times, or La Jaconde, as she's called in France, because uh, that's her name. <laughs> Whoa, look at the size of that painting there. And then look across the room over there. Whoop, whoop, boo, whoop, boo. I feel sorry for all the other paintings in this gallery because they're huge, they're wonderful. I believe this is a big Last Supper painting. Look at the crazy styles these guys are wearing. You got a rock band there sitting below the Lord. You got all these other people. Well, maybe it's not the Last Supper. I forget. You see, I'm forgetting things that I thought I already knew. Anyway, I feel sorry for all the other paintings in here because the attention is all grabbed by that tiny little thing over there. And really, people always say that, oh, the Mona Lisa, she's so tiny. She's not really tiny at all. She's not small. It's a large, normal-sized painting, just like some of the other smaller, uh, smaller, other paintings on this wall over here. It's just that they put her over there on that wall all alone behind this giant sheet of bulletproof, bomb-proof, crazy glass over there. So relatively speaking, in the context, she looks so tiny. But she's not actually a tiny painting, it's just, and you also, by the way, can't get close to her. Hopefully I'll get close enough to show you what I mean. And we've been here before. If you've been watching for a long time or watching any of the old Sometimes vlogs or videos from France you've seen me do, then you know that you can't get close. They have like this, it's not like this. It's not like these bars where you're a few feet away and if you stick your arm over, it'll set an alarm off. No, there's this huge thing that comes out in a semicircle so that you can't get close or touch her. And that's because people have attempted to vandalize Mona Lisa. They've thrown stuff at the glass and paint and all kinds of crazy stuff. Even still today, even though they know she's safe, they'll still try. And the Mona Lisa, believe it or not, was actually stolen out of the Louvre. Stolen out of this museum, the most famous museum in the world, years ago by this guy who pretty much stuck it on his table and ha it's a whole long crazy story. Look up the story about how the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre and who had it and how they found it. It's a whole fascinating thing. Anyway, as you can see, there's quite a line to see her. And um, I was gonna say, if you've ever seen any of my previous visits, uh, then you'll know. See, there you go. La Gioconde or La Gioconda. Ooh, in Italian. Um, you'll have seen that I've gotten pretty close to Mona Lisa, taken, taken the funny selfies and done all that kind of stuff. And uh, there's always a crowd, but there's never a crowd like this. That's because I've never come here on a Saturday before. But today, being rainy and soggy, I was walking around thinking, where am I gonna go in Paris today? I already did a lot of stuff yesterday, and I thought, I wanna do the sometimes vlog. I wanna hang out with you guys. And so I wanted to do a little bit of filming. Oh, why, am I look why are you looking at me? Look at the Mona Lisa. Um, so I knew I wanted to do a little bit of filming somewhere. And anyway, it was so rainy and miserable outside that the three other places I was thinking of going, I was walking around for a while. Like I said, I got all wet. See, there you go. Look at that. There's the little barricade thing. And there she is. She's not that, she's not that tiny. She's really not that tiny. But boy, does she look tiny. I mean, compare her to like a person, you know. Anyway, crazy, beautiful. So we just skipped the line to see her from the side there. You're not really supposed to. Uh, if we stand there much longer, they would have waved us away. So we'll, we'll back up for a while. I may stand in this line in a second just to get a little bit closer. But yeah, I've never been here on a Saturday before and that is the reason why. It is out of control. The line is huge. Look at the size of that line. But there she is back there. The Mona Lisa, the most famous painting in the world. And part of becoming the most famous painting in the world was actually, she's a well-known painting, Leonardo, all that kind of stuff, the, the smile. Of course, she used to have eyebrows, but they faded off in time. So we look at her today, she's a little cracked, she's a little old. She could use some skin care there. But um, yeah, well, I, I love how I'm pointing at this because we can get close to this instead of pointing at that, the real painting. But part of it was the theft, the art theft made her 
one of the most famous paintings in the world, and her popularity has just continued to rise and skyrocket and gone up and up and up. And it's funny because anytime I go to art museums or even mention an art museum, there's always the wet blanket who has to go, museums, you know, I mentioned the British Museum once, people are like, oh, I wouldn't mention the British Museum. You know how they've got art treasures from other countries. There's always a wet blanket who wants to talk about the, the most controversial aspect or the, um, I don't know, somebody always has to bring up the sour, th the sour note or the sad fact or the, you know, someone's got to rain on the parade. You can't just stand in the art museum and be happy that you're seeing something. But it's funny because one time I was here, I might have been using Periscope or something. Periscope. And uh, somebody was like, that's terrible that they have the Mona Lisa here. And I was like, oh, why, why is that terrible? And they were, oh, watch out for this piece of art. Don't look at this, this piece of art over here. Don't look at, don't. I don't draw your attention to that guy's t-shirt. Uh, I go, why is it terrible that they have the Mona Lisa here? And they go, because it, should, it belongs in Italy. It belongs in Italy. Well, Leonardo da Vinci actually moved, because they thought it was like some kind of looted, stolen, Napoleonic art treasure. No, no. Leonardo da Vinci moved from Italy here, and the French kings were his patrons. So he actually was here as part of the French court and uh, the French king purchased that painting. So it, France owns that painting. So it was kind of funny because somebody was just, you know, it's a call out culture kind of thing. And they, you know, evil things should be called out. Don't get me wrong. It's just, that's sort of not my bailiwick. That's sort of not my turf. So um, I get it. I get it on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's like, you ever hang out with those people that like always bring that up and like everywhere you go, there's something wrong. Like, Anyway, so there she is, the Mona Lisa. I may stand in that line, like I said, in a second, but I'm gonna walk out here and just whew, breathe the free air. I went from being soggy and freezing cold outside. It's in the 40s. It's kind of the same as California, actually, right now. It's not too bad. I went from soggy and freezing cold and moist and wet foot to like overwhelmingly hot in there. You hear that noise? Why does it sound like somebody's vacuuming upstairs in the Louvre? Anyway, it is not that bright outside. Those are fake lights up there. Isn't this insane? The Louvre. The thing is, the Louvre has ruined... I got a buddy that flies me here. I guess I should explain what I'm doing here just in case you don't see any other videos first. I'm in France because my friend who used to bring me to France is once again in France and going to LA for the first time in three years, first time since the pandemic, and brought me here like, dude, we want you to come with the whole group and the whole thing, and we're all going to LA, and you gotta fly out here, and we'll meet you, are you sure you want me to do that? The reason Allie's not here is because she just started school, so, and it's a really quick trip. I didn't even know if we'd have more than one day in Paris, which is why I filmed everything yesterday. So anyway, I jumped over here, just jumped across the pond, you know, across the big puddle, and um, headed to Paris. Why was I bringing this up? I'm bamboozled by all, all, the, all, all the art, by all the art. Wow. So anyway, I headed over to Paris uh, to do that. And, uh, oh, that's what I was gonna say. So whenever this, particular person who has means, um, and by the way, isn't a celebrity. People are always like, I wonder who Justin's friend is. He must be some kind of celebrity. No, not a celebrity at all. Just a normal person who, well, not a normal person because a person of means, but a person who just prefers to stay anonymous, not be on the internet, and somebody wants to stay anonymous and not be on the internet. I'm not the one to point a camera at them or reveal their name, but it's not a secret. It's not Harrison Ford or anything. If it was, I would have let it out by now. I would have told people and they would have told you. Do you know what I mean? Because I wouldn't be able to keep that a secret. Harrison Ford flew me to Paris. That would be awesome. I, I, he would literally fly me to Paris in his airplane. But that's what I was going to bring up. So this person flies me over here and they always fly me business class. And I've actually flown first class too on Air France. And business class on Air France for the international over the Atlantic flight uh, gives you this little pod like seat and you can put your feet all the way out in front. I'm sticking my feet out as if you could see them. Sticking your feet out all the way out in front of you. And then the thing actually lays down into a bed. They give you a pillow and a blanket and you go to sleep on the plane and they bring you a little meal. It's very fancy. Completely ruined airplanes for me for the rest of my life because every other flight I get on ever since then, I used to love planes. I'd be excited to get on the plane. Now every plane I get on, I'm like <laughs> sad potato because I'm like, I know that there are planes and people in the world flying around with their feet out, laying down in the lap of luxury, and I'm sitting in the little seat with three other people like, oh. <laughs> so completely ruined planes for me. And then, you know, uh, and the Louvre is similar. The Louvre has completely ruined art museums for me. So like I went to LACMA, that's the LA County Museum of Art, by the way, if I didn't mention that earlier. 
I went to LACMA recently, and almost, and I like LACMA, but the whole museum was pretty much closed. They're rebuilding the whole thing. So Ali and I went there to go on a cute art date, look at some medieval paintings. There were no medieval paintings or mummies or anything like that. Because, ooh, look at this, you can actually see, see out the window up here, some of those statues looking out over the Tuileries. Wow, see now this part of the building juts out past that pyramid and that courtyard we were in. This is the sort of end of the original palace. And then there's these extensions, these wings, whoosh, that would have pretty much connected to another palace called the Tuileries, which is where Napoleon ended up. And that was sort of the main palace for the kings. Uh, the Louvre is actually always sort of a bee palace. It started out as one of the king's hunting lodges a zillion years ago and all this stuff. Anyway, the Louvre has ruined all of the art museums because I went to LACMA, most of it was closed. You know, like the little modern art gallery was open. I'm walking around, it's these little tiny rooms. And I'm like, dang it. So I'm looking at other art museums. They're all really small. I just want a big art museum to wander around in. And, and people were like, what? This museum's great and this museum's great. And I realized, you're right, those little museums are great. But they just seem so little to me after this after you can walk in pretty much every single painting, I was gonna say is a work of art. That is dumb. But I never said I was smart. <laughs> every single painting is a masterpiece, let's put it that way. In fact, there's some actually really cool uh, pieces of art just over here, I believe. There's some French art, now see, I, I can't believe I found the Mona Lisa. The first time I ever came here, I was having a hard time finding her because there was also a crowd and they were standing in front of those little signs that I was showing you that bled the way to Mona Lisa. And so it took me a little while to, to figure out where she was. Um, but I, so I was pleasantly surprised to find that I remembered exactly where I was going. I even knew when I took a wrong turn earlier and all that stuff. Um, but the rest of the museum, it's gonna take me a minute to get reacquainted. So I'm talking and not thinking and looking but look at this, look at that. This has ruined all other art museums for me because it's just all these different types of art. I um, mean, there's no Jackson Pollock in here or anything like that. And if you want the Impressionists, you've got to go to another museum. So I should say all types of old classical art and medieval art and just sort of ancient art. And then you have the actual museum itself. Wow, just mind blowing. The older parts of it, um, the parts that were legitimately used as like a palace are crazy, just nuts, like so fascinating to go into. So anyway, somebody was giving me a hard time on Facebook or somewhere like that. And they like, oh, you're complaining about this in this museum? California has wonderful museums. California has nothing like this. I think I made a post saying like, you know, New York has a giant art museums and um, London has the British Museum. That's where the British thing came in and somebody had to wet blanket it, um, which I, I kind of understand too, but, uh, at the same time, it's like, ah, that wasn't the point. The point wasn't, isn't the British Museum wonderful in everything they do? The point was, London has these, in, London has multiple huge museums, not as big as the Louvre, but if you, you know, cumulatively, you add them together, maybe they would rival the Louvre, I'm not sure. It's been a while since I was in the Tate and the Victoria and Albert Museum, and then you got the British Museum with all the artifacts and all that kind of stuff, the history and art all combined. But, um, London has got that. New York has got big, fancy art museums with lots of stuff to see. And uh, LA has got LACMA. There's a few other museums, like the Getty, but compared to just this room, look at the size of that, the length of that, the breadth of that, the depth of that. We have nothing like this. And so that was my point. It was just like, California is maybe the richest state in the richest country in the world. Now, when France was the richest country in the world, and particularly during the Napoleonic era and all that kind of stuff, they spent their money or acquired their plunder, either or, on getting art and art treasures. And then uh, after the revolution, you know, in France, when this became a public art gallery instead of just the collection of the kings, they pretty much appropriated the uh, royals collection of art. But California, super rich tech billionaires and all that kind of stuff and not a lot of huge art museums. Then again, what would be in our art museum? Campbell soup can paintings and stuff like that. I don't think it would be French masters and Italian masters, but you never know. I have to assume with all the wealthy people, because look at William Randolph Hearst, and you have Hearst Castle, which has a heck of an art collection in California. You have J. Paul Getty and the Getty Museum. They have a heck of an art collection in California. Um, so I have to imagine that the nouveau riche, the new rich folks, the tech rich folks, 
they must also be amassing art collections, right? It's sort of like a rich people thing to do. And so I'm just wondering why we can't get together and build a big California art museum, the California Museum of Art. Well, then again, maybe it's easier just to fly all the way to Paris to see the Louvre. Anyway, um, I forgot. I only have a limited amount of time, like recording time. So I'm going to go see about standing in line for Mona Lisa. And then either we'll get close to her or we won't. And I'll be right back. Wow, there she is. I'm being really quiet and holding the microphone close to my face because I'm in a giant, thick crowd of people who aren't the point. Look at this. We're only four people back or something like that from the, the painting. This is the reason she looks so tiny. Because, okay, so I'm four people back. This lady is number four from the barricade. So even if you get all the way up to that wooden bar up there, which I've been, I've been all the way up to the wooden bar, even if you get all the way up there, you're still quite a distance. You're still several feet back from her. So it's a good place to do this. If you can see the phones, you know, it's a good place to zoom in your phone and get a picture. Obviously I have this wide angle lens, so I'm standing here showing it pretty much the way it would look with an iPhone from the very back of the room, which is a little bit of waste time. Oh, we're getting a little closer, getting a little closer. Got a wedge in here. Let's all get pickpocketed together, folks. But there she is, La Jacon, the Mona Lisa. We did it. Mission accomplished. made it to the front. Ah. It took a while. It took a while. It was very crowded. Hopefully I'll be able to cut in a clip of what it was like at the front. It was pretty wild. People were pushing and shoving. Haven't seen that much pushing and shoving or been in that much pushing and shoving since like, I don't know, rock concerts or something like that. It's pretty, pretty crazy. Anyway, here's this whole other gallery of French painting in here, which I absolutely love this room, this big red room with very famous French painters like Delacroix and all these guys. Look at these paintings. Some of them are just, they're very dramatic. Uh, many of them hail from the time of Napoleon, as you will see, and the French Revolution. And that right there is one of my absolute favorites. We'll get to that one in a second. But here is another painting that's often overlooked now. You don't see a lot of this. Like you don't see a lot of postcards or mugs with this. This is Jericho. I can't remember the name. Let's go see the plaque. Instead of me just trying to remember, why don't I tell you? This is a whole wreck here. Let's see. The raft of the Medusa. Right, okay, so there was a ship. There was a shipwreck and all this kind of stuff, and all these guys had to survive. The raft of the Medusa. Now look at that painting right there. Absorb its form. You see the guys hanging out on the raft down there. Okay, so now we move over to this painting over here with good old Liberty up there on top of the barricades. Can't ever remember the name. Let's see. Oh yeah, well, it's Liberty guiding the people. So that's why I can never remember the name. So I'm just like, you know, the one with Liberty and she's with all the people. What's the name of it? That's pretty much every single time I come here. Now look at the composition there. That's Delacroix, but it's very, very similar to that Jericho painting that we just saw. So it's almost like, I'm not an art historian, but isn't it similar? Do you think so? Am I crazy? It's almost like one was inspired by the other. Anyway, I'm fascinated by Napoleon and Napoleonic stuff. I'm not like a, in any way have I gone down that rabbit hole. It's like, I waited until I was in my mid-30s to go way down the Civil War rabbit hole. I knew a lot about the Civil War just context-wise, being a Lincoln guy and being a Mark Twain guy and just knowing about the history of the 19th century. You have to know some about the Civil War, but I never like, bought the Shelby Foot books or went way down the rabbit holes of individual battles. It's only now, at the end of my 30s, into my 40s, that I started doing that because I always knew that's a deep rabbit hole. You, need to, it's a, you have to have some dedication to go down into all that kind of stuff, right? And Napoleon, the Napoleonic Wars, that's a whole other one that I know, you know those old timers, they go way down that deep, deep down that rabbit hole, getting all into it. So I don't know much, I read a few books, but I haven't got like deep into the whole history of the Russian invasion or Napoleon taking over after the revolution or anything. But look at this, look at the size 
of this painting right here. Wow, good thing we have a very wide, I mean, look at those ladies there. And look at the size of that. Look at people walking by in the foreground. They're not even next to the painting. And look how huge that thing is. There's Napoleon up there. He's waving his hand off camera. He's, he's looking at something over here. You got all these people freezing to death in the snow. Let me see what the title of the painting is. Uh, I can't read that. It's in French. Napoleon on the battlefield of Eilau. Oh, I can't pronounce that. So there's Napoleon on a battlefield. We already knew that. Here's Napoleon over here. He probably commissioned this painting. He loved to have himself painted, which is just gross. Anyway, you see Napoleon up there, he's waving, he's telling people something, and I always wondered, what's he telling people? Well, as you can see, his guys look awfully warm. They've got their fuzzy hats, they got their furry coats here. These other guys, they're all frozen. So I think what he's doing is telling people, put some clothes on. Put some clothes on, guys. And that's on brand for Napoleon, because as you'll notice over here in this painting behind me, this painting right here of Napoleon, he is also telling these guys, guys, put some clothes on. You know, put, put some clothes on. They're saying, well, it's not, we're, we're not in a cold battlefield here. It's warm. Look at all these nude folks. They're hanging out. They're nude. They got a couple of light sheets on, you know. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. You need clothes. Look at me. I'm fully dressed. You guys should be fully dressed. This guy doesn't look convinced. He does not look convinced. This guy looks like he might want to join the nudes. He looks French. He looks like he might have found some... He might want to, he might want to join the nudies. Okay. All I can think of now is that I'm in, in... in some of the most memorable paintings here, right in the midst of some of the most memorable paintings of all the paintings in the Louvre because of that uh, Five Weird Things in the Louvre video when I was walking around and filming all this art. Do you remember this character here? Yes! <laughs> ah, it's always a good time here. It's worth coming to Paris, I would say. If you're ever coming here or getting a chance and it's like kind of a stretch, but you could maybe get an extra day or anything like that, it is literally worth having an extra day in Paris just to see the Louvre. And you really need an entire day, if not multiple days. I keep wanting to adjust this strap and the strap is fine. Um, I'm trying to get up close to these stairs here, but there's people taking pics. Okay, look at that. So you remember Audrey Hepburn runs down here. <laughs> Ali loves that movie, Funny Face. Next time we come to Paris, hopefully we'll have an extra day and we'll just go find all the Funny Face filming locations that we can. Your sunny, funny face. It's a weird movie. It's only weird well, anyway, that's a whole separate topic of conversation. The only thing I will say about the Louvre is for me, never again on a Saturday. You gotta watch out. There's free days where it's open for free and it's packed. And there are days, and I don't know if it's just to people in France or to everybody, but there are days where it's free. It doesn't cost admission to come in here. And it gets super, super packed. And then there are other days like today where there are a heck of a lot of tourists it's a Friday, it's a Saturday, and so everybody's off work. And so you have the mix of not just the tourists you would have anyways, but also people from all around France who are coming to check out their incredible museum. And why wouldn't they? The weird thing about Paris is there are definitely parts that are all tourists, but I don't think there's any, I don't think there's many. Most of the places I go that are very touristy, there are people living in those neighborhoods, there are people talking and chatting in those neighborhoods. Trying to remember exactly where I'm going over here. Hold on, there are little signs. And uh, yeah, so I wouldn't recommend doing it on a Saturday unless you had no other choice. And then it would be worth it. It'd be worth it no matter what. Okay, there's one other lady we have to see. I didn't expect the Sometimes vlog to be in the Louvre where I've been before. This has been a very tiring trip. I got here, sort of have trip whiplash the first day we were here. We didn't get checked into the hotel until super late. And so nobody went to bed until super late. And um, there was really nothing we could do. Second day I was here, which is the first full day I was here, yesterday I went and filmed the whole Random Land thing, so if you've seen that already, or if you're going to see it, uh, for context, I was just running around the entire city. Today it was supposed to be sunny, I think, or, well, at least less cloudy than yesterday, but instead, 
It's just one solid wet cloud. I just checked out the windows. It is still just drizzle wet out there. In fact, it looks like it's actually more rain than drizzle. Like earlier, it was all drizzly. And uh, so I didn't expect to be sometimes vlogging in the loo, right? especially for this long. Look at this. This is what I'm talking about about Saturday. We're just crammed in here. Everybody's looking around. Look at the ceilings. I can't get enough of those ceilings. But yes, yeah, Saturday is it's wall to wall. So, I mean, some people don't mind this kind of thing. They like it, especially in Paris. I've noticed a lot of people come here. They like to be seen. They want to sit in the middle of the restaurant where everyone can see them. They want to. Um, French God? They want, they want to be noticed, they want to be, I mean, it's, a, it's one of those cities. It's a place where you come to see and be seen and all that kind of stuff. And here we go, speaking of seeing, the derriere. La derriere de Venus de Milo. Look at that derriere over there. <laughs> There's the back side of the Venus de Milo, the side nobody ever takes pictures of, but I just got in a whole bunch of people's photos. And there she is, the other lady in my life in Paris. When Allie's at school, this is, these are the kind of floozies I meet up with. Lisa and Venus over there. Um, otherwise, it's a total just mayhem madness of me running around. So there you go, the Venus de Milo. Those are my go-to things. So I figured as long as we went and saw the Mona Lisa and other things we've seen before, or I've seen before, years, years, and years, and years ago, we might as well go see them uh, in there. Anyway, I'm running out of time now because, um, well, low battery, no 4K, but yeah, my whole point was, I didn't expect to be coming back to this thing, but you know what? Any excuse to come to the Louvre, it's not like it's not worth your time. I mean, look at this. That is incredible. You find these marble figures in Athens, Rome. I think that one's also, uh, yeah, these are also Greek. So you got a lot of Greek statues in here, classical Greek statues of Virgil's children because there are parts on show. There are other ones that have been dutifully censored. See some of the flickering lights? Uh, you'll get some lights that aren't and some lights that are. And somebody suggested to me like, oh, if you switch your cameras to PAL format, which is like the European format, It'll stop the flicker, and it does for the flickering ones, but then all the bulbs that don't flicker, flicker. So you always got some kind of flickering going on in Europe. They don't have a consistent uh, LED frame rate or something like that over here. It's always the LED lights, the modern lights. Obviously, the incandescent lights don't flicker. So anyway, I didn't expect to be back here, but it's always a pleasure to come here and uh, basically just turn rain into sunshine by heading into the loo. So I'm looking out there now. Yeah, still pretty moist, but actually, I don't see the drizzle that I saw when I was upstairs looking out. Look at this. The ground is still wet, but I see a lot less hoods, and I see a lot less umbrellas out, so that is a good sign. So maybe we'll get to see a little bit outside as well, but not unless I turn the camera off right now, or we'll run out of film. Didn't intend to have this all disjointed and edited, but as long as I'm walking out anyways, we might as well see a few more things. There is a gluten-free restaurant I found last time I was in Paris. It's called Little Nona. It's a gluten-free pizza place. Look at all these tiles and everything. Look at the size of these vaulted rooms. I just saw in the gift shop. Uh, oh, well, I guess I should finish one thought. Uh, yeah, there's an Italian restaurant called Little Nona. And I was all excited to go back and go get the pizza at this place. It's all gluten-free and they have celiac, so everything in the place is gluten-free. But the problem is it closes right now at three, Italian style, like they do in Italy. It closes for a siesta and they don't reopen again until seven, so they basically have you know, four hours off in the middle of the day. So I wasn't gonna make it there anyway, so looks like we're wandering around Hungary and France. Mostly I packed an entire suitcase full of Doritos and stuff like that so I can eat en France because not a lot is safe here. Uh, for me, uh, with celiac, it's getting better. And there are groceries that I buy, so I did go to the grocery store the other day. Well, I have no idea where that cut off uh, at because the battery suddenly died and I was still just walking through the Louvre talking about how the pizza place is closed. I'm not gonna get any pizza for now. But I did make it outside. I forgot that it takes like about an hour to get out of that museum. And by the time I got outside, it is once again pretty rainy and miserable, but the French don't seem to mind. And look at this. Bubbles. Uh, Bubbles is the name of the guy. 
Th these are something else. Look at, look at that one floating away. Jeez Louise, okay. And now to the river, because we got to wind things up today. And I got to make it back to the hotel to eat well. Whoa. There's some stuff I want to pick up for Allie still. Ah! All the children are screaming. There's <laughs> some stuff I want to pick up from Allie today and some other stuff that I have to do before I meet up with my group again. Then hopefully onward to adventure. There's actually a sign in the Louvre downstairs, like in the mall area that says, adventure awaits. But first, Paris. Couldn't be more true. Oh, finally. We're out and away. Escape from the Louvre should be the title of a movie. And look at this. This is insane. Well, actually that boat's insane. In the Seine River down there, look at, you can see the Eiffel Tower just barely sticking up above those roofs. And it's kind of grayed out because that's all the rainy, misty junk that's been getting in our faces. Look at those people doing the Jean Valjean walk down there. I love it. I love Paris when I'm in it. When I'm away from it, all I think of are the bad parts. Normally, when you're done with the journey, you remember the good memories and, and everything else fades away. For whatever reason, for me, I think it's because it's anywhere that's cold. I remember being cold. I remember being hungry and all the good parts fade away. Then I get to Paris and I'm like, oh yeah, I know this and this place and that and the other thing. So it is very cool to be back. When I'm here, I really enjoy it. It's one of the strangest things because almost everywhere else people remember the good stuff and forget about the bad stuff, all the miseries and being tired and sore or hungry. That all fades away and what they remember are the good memories, the funny stories. I'm exactly the opposite when it comes to Europe. Something about crossing the Atlantic Ocean messes with my brain. Anyway, we're outside now along the Seine. You can see all the little green boxes over there. Those are what I am the most obsessed with for some reason. Whenever I come to Paris, I think it's because there's just so many weird knickknacks in there. Old French books, English books, weird little, I don't know, like tchotchkes from bygone eras. And sorry if I'm talking funny, I got a mint in my mouth I should have spit out, but I don't want to spit it in the river. I don't know who's drinking out of that. Anyway, uh, yes, it's just weird. Just very strange. But yeah, so they have all these like weird knickknacks and stuff in there. I'm hoping some of them are open over yonder. Nobody's coming this way. I guess we can cross the street. Oh, no. It all turns yellow and red. Luckily, nobody's coming across this bridge as I was crossing it. You know, it's weird. French people are like never in a hurry, sort of a famous stereotype about French people, right? That they're just like, they take their time, they walk so slowly. You're walking down the sidewalk, there'll be French people walking very slowly, maybe having a cigarette, something like that. Um, but they have absolutely no patience when it comes to crossing the street. They will jaywalk at the drop of a hat. They will jaywalk into traffic and walk across it. Now, it's funny how like, you know, for every cultural stereotype, there's something else that you don't expect or something that breaks the mold, you know. Anyway, here we are. Look at that. Place Justin. Maybe one day they'll change it to Place Justin Scar. Blast Justin Scar. Yes, they love me here. They're gonna love me forever in France. Uh-oh, see, look at, we got the little dirty lens action going. Got the dirty lens. That's fun. <laughs> anyway, there they are. You can see all the little kiosks along the river with old posters. Look at that. How can you not like that? The old movie posters. Oh, there's some old Disney posters right there. What does that say? Donald's Penguin? Oh, I've got to check that out. And then all the different posters and touristy stuff, like for France, you know, like the posters of the Eiffel Tower, kind of like prints, prints like art prints, like of the Eiffel Tower or um, Notre Dame, all that kind of stuff. And I filmed a lot of this yesterday when I was walking around doing random land stuff. I'm back because there was a couple of things I didn't have room in my bag for that I wanted to grab really quick. And so this is pretty much where I close out our adventure today. So I'm out of time, out of footage. Look at all these pigeons down here. Look at all these pigeons. I should say actually yesterday, see look, building the Eiffel Tower. You got all these old prints. These are all old French magazines. And sometimes they'll have old prints from old French books. Here's these classic hipster girl French novels right here. Ooh, look at that. So French books. And then there was one of them yesterday. I think it was right here actually. It's closed now. 
that had French movie posters, but not of French movies, of like our film. So there was like horror movies and Frankenstein and all these things, and there was a French posters. I really wanted to grab one. I realized I can't get a whole poster home this time. I don't really have like a tube or anything like that. If I'm ever here for like a longer time or I have alley where we have four suitcases instead of just two, I would love to bring a poster tube with me or buy one here, but they have those like painting tubes that you can carry kind of over your shoulder. They're like, I don't know if they, it's like the one time I don't see anyone carrying any in a tourist area, but there's, there's like sort of these long tubes. And it looks like they're carrying like the things that you put the Star Wars lightsabers in at Disneyland or something like that. And those long tubes are for paintings. You'll buy a painting and they'll take it off the frame, roll it up and put it in that tube. So they're like giant poster tubes and they have them for tourists out here. Um, anyway, it's not gonna happen this trip. So I'm gonna head down to some more kiosks. Look at it, he's got some Van Gogh paintings right there and some other stuff. Incidentally, yesterday, um, when I bought a painting in Montmartre, I bought it from the artist and I made sure he told me like where he painted it, I went and looked and I looked as he showed me some pictures of him painting, he showed me like his current art that he works on and all that stuff. There are a lot of canvas paintings in Paris in the gift shops, but those are usually not painted by people from France. They're painted in workshops in China. And there's this really fascinating documentary about Van Gogh in particular. Look at that. So you have these canvases here. And they're actually painted. So they're 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 cheap, but they're pricey. They're actually painted, and there's a there's a movie, a documentary. I can't remember what streaming service. I keep doing this, I keep bringing up documentaries I watched and not knowing the service, but um, there's a documentary about so I think it's called China's Van Goghs or something like that. And it's all about these guys that spend their whole life painting these Van Gogh paintings. And this one artist in particular, he finally gets to go to the Van Gogh Museum and see Van Gogh's real paintings. And he gets to see where his copies of Van Gogh are being sold. And so he gets to Europe, of course, and he's so excited. And of course, it's like a little kiosk. It's like that. It's like a little tourist thing where they sell cigarettes and Coke and they sell these rolled up paintings that they put all this work into and they work so hard because they think people love their art their Van Gogh copies, and he just really sees for the first time, like, they're selling it for, you know, 30 times what I sold it to them for, and people are just buying it for, like, a souvenir. Like, we're just making souvenirs. It was, like, heartbreaking, that part. But then, by the end, he goes back to China, and he starts this whole, well, I love how I'm talking about China in France, but he starts this whole mission to like paint his own original art and his original art piece are like really cool. I actually contacted uh, the guy through his agent online uh, to see about buying one of his paintings, but they are not 20 euro to, uh, souvenir paintings anymore, let me tell you. They are a couple thousand dollars, which is, if I was a couple thousand dollars spending kind of art collecting type of person, I would absolutely spend the money because I think it's such a cool story and very cool to support the guy. I can't think of his name at the moment. I follow him on Instagram, I gotta find him. but. Uh, yeah, so China's Van Gogh's, look that up. Anyway, I could keep walking and talking all day, except I can't because we're running out of memory card because I forgot to erase the memory card. But here we are in the Palme d'Ars. I filmed this yesterday as well. And finally, it's raining over there and it's finally cleared up over here enough to just sort of walk in here. This is the Love Bridge, the one that had all the locks, you remember? Yeah, I feel very incoherent, man. I landed, I really haven't got an entire night's sleep yet. So the first thing I did when I landed is I filmed. I walked around and filmed something like this, just a walk and talk. I was making absolutely no sense. I don't even know if I'll upload it. So if you've seen it, I don't know. I guess you can decide for yourself how incoherent I really was. I felt like I made no sense because nothing was making sense. I'm like walking around. I'm in Paris. Oh, this is crazy, the Eiffel Tower. Ah. And I went out and yesterday, I had had finally some sleep. I filmed a whole crazy random land adventure took all day, walked all over the place, including right here. So now, day three, the rainy, soggy, weird walk around day of edits and going inside unexpectedly to the Louvre and then coming back unexpectedly to the same bridge where I was yesterday, I'm tripping a little. Anyway, the plan is to move on from here and head off to other adventures before I whip around right back home because that is the whole deal, is that I'm just here to help somebody fly back to the United States. So that's all we're doing. Oh, but my point about the paintings was just, yeah, if you buy them from the tourist shops like that, you're going to be buying something that was painted basically in a sweatshop, which you could argue is 
bad, you could argue, is good for the poor people who are making the paintings because they're trying to run a little business selling the paintings for tourists. So, yeah. But if you're looking for an authentic souvenir, just make sure you're buying it from somebody with a rack of paintings who's actually got paint on their hands and is actually painting. Because they are, there are a lot of people out here who do little tourist paintings and they'll sell them. And they're typically like 60, you know, 50, 60, 80 euro, even for a little small one, because they sat there and painted it right here in France versus something they imported from China in a room full of people just making a bunch of Van Gogh copies or something like that. So something to look out for. It's not a foolproof system. You can be fooled. They can take the uh, overseas ones and sell them <laughs> on the side of the river too as they're painting a different painting. But um, yeah, weird. So anyway, it's finally a beautiful day, kind of. Still a little misty, not perfect, but I'm in France. So for once, I'm gonna shut up, turn off the camera, take a little walk, Go try and pick up something for Allie and uh, head back to the hotel room, eat the tons of Doritos and peanut butter and jelly and gluten-free bread that I brought with me from the United States, like a psycho. I'm sure <laughs> French people are weird about food. Actually, last night, I'll tell you, I got taken out to a restaurant with some people. And so, of course, they're always trying to feed me and they're asking like, oh, can you do gluten-free? And the guy says, you order anything you want, I'll take care of the rest. I'm like, oh, awesome. So he comes back and I'm like, oh, how about the, the, the chicken? I was like, oh, I don't know what the chi what's inside of the chicken, maybe, and then and we're like, oh, okay. So uh, it's like one of those things, like they're so confident about gluten-free, then you get the thing and, it and there's like, they hand you bread with it and all that kind of stuff, so can you really trust it? I gotta get more fluent in French, I guess, before I can really eat here. But there are some gluten-free restaurants, like I mentioned, the pizza place, which I can't get to until seven is when it reopens. So they're taking a little siesta, but I'll get there at seven o'clock at night, have the pizza, maybe tonight, uh, if I'm lucky. But in the meantime, walk, shop, Doritos, hotel, sleep well. You guys have done your duty. I probably won't see you in the Sometimes Vlog till the United States, or will I? Hmm. We'll just have to find out. For now, you've done your duty. Go home, sleep well. Thanks for hanging out with me, guys. See you next time.